I want to focus on the second part of the gospel message this morning. It says, let the children, is, these are familiar words, let the children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. The kingdom of God belongs to those who are like children. And many, many words have been said, much ink has been spilled over what those words actually mean. What is Jesus actually getting at when he says that? In what ways exactly is Jesus inviting us to become like children? Is it because they're so cute and so adorable? I mean, I, I came across, you may have heard some of these children's letters to God. You ever heard some of these? Uh, Dear God, mommy says all babies cry. Uh, but I bet uh, Jesus, I don't think baby Jesus did. And you must know the answer. So please write back. Uh, mommy and I have a bet. All right. Or, um, or this one, uh, dear Jesus, uh, please don't come back before the next Cars movie. Right. Or, um, dear God, we went to this wedding and they kissed right in church. Is that okay? I mean, those are great, and they're innocent, and they're sweet, um, you know, but is is it true? Is it is it because that children are so innocent like that, that, that Jesus is inviting us to become like them? I mean, I'd argue that while children can and they do possess innocent qualities, I, I don't think Jesus is referring to innocence. First, we can't make ourselves innocent as if by our own willpower and effort we could cause ourselves to be full of virtue and empty out any selfish or self-protective tendencies. And further, I, I, think, I think we'd have to admit that children aren't entirely innocent, um, even if uh, they do, you know, haven't developed fully their maybe self-protective capacities, you know, but, but just think about it for a moment. After mama or daddy, what, are, what is one of the first words that children, you know, say? Mine, right, mine. And again, I'm not putting that as evil, but it's just we have this instinct inside of us that is to, to protect and hold, and, and kids even display that, don't they? So, you know, sharing, serving others, those aren't necessarily instinctive. They have to be taught. I don't think Jesus is referring here to innocence, per se. It, it, perhaps it's because children are full of wonder and curiosity, and they marvel at the mystery of the world around them. I mean, that is certainly a beautiful gift. It's one that, that we want to cultivate inside of us. Al, Albert Einstein, you may recall, famously said, there are two ways to live. One is if, as if nothing is a miracle, and the other is if everything is a miracle. And that's a beautiful thought, isn't it? The children seem to naturally possess this instinct to see, the eye, see with eyes of wonder the world, you know, amazement and awe. Just watch a little toddler with a, a blade of grass or a roly-poly bug. My goodness, that's uh, hours of entertainment right there, right? Awe and wonder. And it's worthy of uh, even giving ourselves too. G.K. Chesterton famously said, because children have abounding vitality, because they are in spirit, fierce and free, therefore they want things repeated and unchanged. They always say, do it again and again to the grown-up until the grown-up is nearly dead, right? They always, and, and the, and the grown-up people, he says, I love this. They are not strong enough to exult in monotony. But perhaps God is strong enough, he says, to exult in monotony. It is possible that God says every morning to the sun, do it again. And every evening, do it again to the moon. It may not be automatic necessity that makes all daisies alike. It may be that God makes each daisy separately, but he has just never got tired of making them. It may be, he says, that God has the eternal appetite of infancy. And I love this statement. He, we have sinned and grown old, and our father is younger than we. Mm, it's beautiful, isn't it? It's a wonderful statement. And I think it is a part of what Jesus may be referring to when he tells the disciples and he tells us that we must become like little children. I don't think, though, that's the whole picture or even necessarily the heart of what Jesus is after. Jesus speaks often about the kingdom of God. Over and over again, it was one of his predominant themes. And perhaps nowhere more eloquently and more clearly than what in the message that we call the Sermon on the Mount. It was most likely a sermon that Jesus gave many times. Like 
it was probably what we would call today his stump speech. He probably gave it many times. In fact, in Luke, we get another version of it, and it's sometimes called the Sermon on the Plain because it repeats some of the same, much of the same uh, content from the Sermon on the Mount in a different location. So we, we get a sense that Jesus said these kinds of things a lot, not just that one time. And in the Sermon on the Mount, we have so much description of life in the kingdom of God and what the kingdom of God is all about. And he begins, in fact, that uh, description of life in the kingdom with, with these set of sayings that we have come to call the Beatitudes, right? And the word, you know, Beatitude comes from the, the very word Jesus used, blessed, blessed. And it's, again, it's not what, you know, that word has kind of gotten a little distorted in its meaning in our day. Blessed isn't hashtag blessed, or I just feel blessed today, but it's, a, a, of course, a much richer and deeper reality. Blessed, or the Greek word is makarios, is a quality or state of being that is described or characterized by a fullness of life, a state of wholeness before God. And so it's the very first statement Jesus makes in front of all of these sayings, and it is the very first one of those sayings is this one, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of the heavens, as Dallas Willard famously said, that currently and presently available rule and reign of God that has come near to us in the person of Jesus who has opened the door to access to this kingdom, and in fact, at times could be even described as the kingdom embodied, that kingdom in which God is acting to bring about his good and beautiful and flourishing will, the kingdom that is accessed by uh, only those who are described, in, according to Jesus, only those who are poor in spirit. And so whatever it means to be poor in spirit, then apparently must be akin to, if perhaps even not another description for those who are like a little child. The word used, again, uh, this is another piece of information here. The word used for child here, in, again, that translates the Greek word paideon, which refers not only to an infant, you know, a little baby, but actually any child up to even the age 12 or so. So it's not just infants, in other words. These were children who had some awareness, some of them at least, awareness of themselves and the world around them to some degree. It's not just babies. Now, one more clue, I think, can help us even again to dig in to the meaning Jesus had in mind in this passage. And that is, is to look at the passage and what is it that these parents are bringing their children to Jesus for? The text says to place his hands on them. And specifically, that was an act of blessing, an act of, of blessing from a one who was seen as, who was seen and understood as a rabbi, as a representative of God. And so their desire was that Jesus, as one who spoke for God, would affirm them and confer something of God upon them. So think about that for a moment and think why or what exactly had these children done to merit or deserve, if you will, this blessing? I mean, had they or, or, or their parents, had they, had they given a lot of money to Jesus in his ministry so that they you know, would, would deserve this? Did they come from elite families that deserved to be favored somehow and treated well? Had they been um, good boys and girls who had behaved so well uh, that they should be rewarded? You know, in other words, was, was Jesus like an early version of Santa Claus? You know, that he sit on his lap and to, if you've been good, then you get good gifts. And if not, then you, I don't know, maybe get a lump of coal. We're not sure. I always wonder, did any kids ever really actually get lumps of coal in their stocking? That's a, another whole question, another time. But none of those things clearly are the case with these children that are being brought to Jesus. They are simply children in the simplicity of faith being brought to Jesus so that Jesus could confer upon them a gift they had not earned and could not conjure up for themselves or invoke as their right. One commentator I read, R.L. Cooper, uh, says this well. He said, Jesus' point was, how do children receive gifts? They receive with anticipation. They can't wait. They receive joyfully and thankfully. They receive, and this is the key, without believing they did anything to deserve the gift. 
This is a picture of how we come to the Father. We know we do not deserve the great gifts he has in store for us, but he loves us and he desires to give us good things. So rather than saying, I won't take your gift until I can earn it, we receive the gift of Christ's redemption and his forgiveness, his grace. We receive the gift of Christ's redemption with joy and thanksgiving, and the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I mean, this is the amazing news that this passage confirms, and it celebrates, and it points to us. It's, it's again, and Cooper, again, the commentator says, all who come to Jesus will receive his blessing. In his love and grace, there are no outcasts. And in fact, I would actually tie the, why this passage is put together with the passage on divorce actually has a lot to do with who it was that was being left vulnerable in divorce. In that day, in that culture, it was most often a woman who would have been so easily and readily divorced by her husband who might trade her in for a newer model if he was displeased, if you will. It does happen today, of course, too, but especially in that day, a woman who was divorced by her husband would have been left so very vulnerable, would have see, been seen as not only a second-class citizen, but as less than and discarded. And in Jesus, in, in tying these together, placing them right next to one another, what we're seeing is the beauty of Jesus' welcome to any and all. Children, those who have been abandoned, those who have been rejected, any and all are welcome to come to Jesus, be brought to Jesus for his blessing and his welcome. So beautiful. And so why does Jesus get angry with his disciples in this scene? He, and he is indeed angry. Um, the word that is used is uh, sometimes here is Jesus was irritated or annoyed, but, but actually the word that is used is only used once in all Mark's gospel. And he is not just irritated, he is angry. And he's angry because Jesus wants no one no one, and not even those who are closest to him that think they're acting on his behalf somehow, but especially them, in fact, he wants none of them to interfere with anyone who would desire to come to him in faith. Anyone who would come to Jesus with a posture of desiring to be near him, to receive from him his welcome and his grace and his blessing. Warren Wearsby is a commentator from a number of years ago, and he said, we enter God's kingdom by faith like little children. We're helpless, unable to save ourselves, totally dependent on the mercy and grace of God. We enjoy God's kingdom by faith, believing that the Father loves us and will care for our daily needs. What does a child do when he or she has a hurt or a problem? Take it to father or mother. What an example, he says, for us to follow in our relationship with Jesus, with our Heavenly Father. Yes, and he says this, I, I think it's a good statement. God wants us to be childlike, not childish. Right? Childlike, not childish. But, and while we are certainly meant to mature in our faith, to grow up, even in the uh, Hebrew says, to grow up in respect to our salvation, it doesn't mean that we grow out of a childlike posture of heart and faith. Maturing in faith doesn't mean we somehow become more self-sufficient, more independent, less in need of grace and mercy. I mean, again, Dallas Willard uh, what said, he said the Christian actually is meant to consume more grace, not less. He said the more we mature in faith, we said we consume grace like a 747 burns fuel on takeoff. We are more ex ex experiencing and consuming the grace of God. That is God's desire. The more, so the more we mature in faith, actually, ideally, the more childlike, not childish, childlike we become. Marva Dawn uh, wrote a, a book, a wonderful book called The Sense of the Call, A Sabbath Way of Life. And uh, she says this, and I just, I just pray you let these words sink in. They're just so beautiful. She said, we do not progress in the Christian life by becoming more competent, more knowledgeable, more virtuous or more energetic. We do not advance in the Christian life by acquiring expertise. Each day and many times each day, we return to square one. We hear Jesus say, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And so we become as little children. We adore and we listen. She says, I want to simplify your lives. 
when other when others are telling you read more i want you to read less when others are telling you to do more she's talking to to pastors and ministers especially but but I, it's applicable to all of us but when others are telling you to do more i want to tell you to do less the world does not need more of you she says it needs more of god your friends don't need more of you. They need more of God or perhaps God in you. And you don't need more of you. You need more of God. I, I think we tend to, in, because of the messages of the world around us and our own inner narratives, we tend to believe that we have to do something to gain Jesus' attention or approval. At least that's been true in my own experience in life. And so even though we say with our words and our creeds, and our theology and our doctrine that Jesus' grace is gift and it cannot be earned, deep down, sometimes not even that deep down, we're suspicious of the arrangement. We want to hedge our bets a bit. We try perhaps to stockpile some goodness if we can, or we pull back internally from Jesus if we feel that we've been not as good or undeserving, or even if we haven't been particularly close to him lately, we have to kind of ease our way back or earn our way back even. And meanwhile, Jesus is, is simply waiting and desiring for us to come to him to receive his blessing and his love. Perhaps you find yourselves wanting to, desiring to experience a closeness to Jesus that has been elusive uh, or hard to reach lately. Perhaps it's been a while since you were really convinced, perhaps even more comfortable, just letting your guard down fully with Jesus to experience a freedom, freedom to rest in his forgiveness and genuine affection for you, that he doesn't just love you, but he likes you, free from the weight and burden of guilt or the inner accusations, the shame messages that, that play like maybe broken tapes and broken records in your mind, free to actually have Jesus look at you with a gaze of profound and perfect love. I'm going to try something with you this morning, even here on Zoom. It's a little different, and I want to invite you to in, engage with this passage in just a little bit different way. It's with your not only your, your mind, but your heart in a kind of imaginative way. So I invite you to do something just for a moment here, which won't take very long, but I invite you, perhaps if you would, to close your eyes. And I want to invite you in your mind's eye to picture, if you can, recall maybe a, a picture of yourself when you were in third grade or something around that line. You know, do you remember one of those school pictures that you had or or one of those, um, you know, maybe you have a, a photograph or a memory of what you look like at that age of, you know, seven, eight, nine, something like that. Just picture that. Just hold that image of you in your mind for a moment. And then I'm going to read the passage. And, and, and as, as you enter into this scene, I invite you to place yourself into the scene that's here in this gospel. And I want to invite you in your own mind's eye, there's a freedom of, we'll call this sanctified imagination, term Eugene Peterson used. Notice what's happening. Where are you? Where's Jesus? Perhaps even where are the disciples? Just, just notice what happens in your heart and mind. Let Jesus invite you in the words of this text to come to him so he can bless you. And just enter into that for a moment, if you would. And let me read this text. People were bringing little children, like you and me, to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. But the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus saw this. He was angry. He said to them, let the children come to me. Don't hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children, perhaps you, in his arms. He placed his hands on them, on you, and blessed them. He blessed them. He blesses you as you come to him. Stay with that image if you can for just a moment. Let, let it just sort of linger in your mind. Notice what it feels like. What's the look on Jesus' face? Maybe he, maybe he leans and whispers something in your ear. Maybe he's just wrapped his arms around you. 
There's a beauty and a simplicity in this. To just let Jesus receive you, hold you, bless you, love you. Let me pray for us. Jesus, the one who welcomes us, who welcomes our souls as, as a father so deeply loves his children, who longs to, to draw us near, to bless us, to look at us with such deep affection. I pray that, that you would give us the grace and freedom to sense deep in our spirit how great and wide your love is. I pray perhaps that this image that we've just thought of and considered for a few moments this morning, perhaps it's one we can return to even in this coming week a, a few times, maybe each day what it would feel like, what it would be like for you, Jesus, to hold us in your arms like a child, to look upon us with, with true love and welcome, to be seen, to be known, to be accepted, to be your beloved. I pray you would allow us to become again and again like little children, to return to that posture over and over, to remain childlike, not childish. And I pray this because I believe you have said it is your desire for us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.